thank you ladies for that uh, really uh, insightful discussion on creepiness factor. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, counted how many times the word trust was used. Uh, I, I heard it quite a bit. In fact, I was just writing trust and trust and trust and trust. But what I got out of it was uh, that, you know, there has to be a good balance between servicing you, the client, uh, with something that you want uh, versus the weirdness of knowing that somebody's watching you. Um, and how do we incite programs and companies uh, to build trust amongst the users and how they're going to be using that data? Uh, it needs to be context rich, it needs to be context aware, and it also needs to ensure that consent is accepted, which is critically important when we do some of the necessary marketing. The other one was also around challenging organizations to do the right thing, and that is to enable innovation uh, to better service the customers. I know that I will definitely would be okay if I'm searching for air flights to uh, Hawaii and uh, my phone ends up being lit with all kinds of prices because, you know, I'm there to price shop. So that's, you know, within my, uh, my own tolerance. Um, but in some cases, it's not appropriate. So you have to decide, you know, what, uh, what can we incentivize these organizations to do better on. Um, so the next topic uh, is uh, really dear to my heart. Again, uh, I noticed that the uh, audience has gotten a little full, and I should reintroduce myself. My name is Irene Varungi. I am the Chief Information Security for Interact Corp. Uh, we are Canada's number one trusted brand in financial services. Uh, and we're critically important into the ecosystem of the, of the payment fabric for Canada, both payments and some value exchange, because now we're looking into digital ID. Um, and privilege access management is, is, is something that is a hot topic. It's the new firewall, as it said. Um, and so I would like to uh, welcome Omar Ahmed, uh, Parul Khanna again, Diane Jake, and Ruzbi Tahiri Nia to talk about why PAM is essential to a perimeter-less uh, workplace. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so um, I believe we had um, another participant who was supposed to join us uh, remotely, and there she is, Diane. Thank you for joining. Um, welcome, everyone. I hope you're having a, an amazing game, Women in Cybersecurity uh, 2022. It certainly is uh, a pleasure to be back in person with, with everyone here, and I hope you're enjoying all these sessions. I thought that last session on privacy and data protection was very timely, and I think it's a natural segue to our topic here. And I'd like to welcome uh, Dan Jake, uh, who's joining us uh, from uh, the remote world. Uh, am I audible, Diane? Is it? Is that the most hackneyed phrase in over the last 2.5 years? It is. <laughs> so, Hi, everybody. Apologize, I couldn't be there. I'm in quarantine. I have COVID, so uh, this is why I'm, uh, you know, virtual here uh, to be with you guys today. Perfect. A uh, big, a bit of an introduction. My name is Omar Ahmed. I'm managing partner of Epsidy Security, uh, based out of Toronto, and we are subject matter experts in identity and access management and privileged access management. Uh, the raison d'etre of our company is essentially to help uh, uh, enterprises securely navigate their digital, digital transformation journeys. So uh, in, on behalf of Epsidy and Beyond Trust, our sponsors, and CyberX, I'd like to welcome you to the session. And I'd like to quickly turn it over first to Diane for a quick intro. Um, Diane, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Diane Jake. I'm the Senior Project Manager for uh, Royal Bank of uh, Canada. Um, I manage um, a couple of uh, products within RBC. One is the Privileged Access Management, and the other one is Authorization and Authentication to 25 Plus Banking and Contact Center um, Applications. Thank you, Diane. Um, I'll go over to Ruzbe for a quick intro. Hello, uh, am I audible? <laughs> <laughs> and another <laughs> overly used phrase. Uh, my name is Ruzbe Tahirinia. I'm the Identity Access Management Program Lead at the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. Um, my uh, responsibilities involve uh, refreshing the Identity Access Management Program, uh, and underneath that it would be privileged access management, identity governance and administration, and uh, access management uh, across the fund. 
Thank you, Ruzbe. Uh, Peru, over to you. Yeah, oh boy, it feels like deja vu again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a different uh, career. Sure, <laughs> <Highlights>. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, hello everyone again, and uh, yeah, definitely proud to be part of this panel again. Um, so I'm Parul Khanna, I work as a senior consultant for uh, manual life in the field of information risk management. Uh, prior to that, I've had the experience of working as a software developer. So I know like, so from software developer to cybersecurity, it's a very uh, big, big hop, but yeah, I managed to do that. And then I've also been involved as a SOC analyst and working with the uh, DLP department for a Canadian bank. So that's me in a nutshell, and I've had my master's degree, and I'm working towards my certifications. So yeah, that's, that's a bit about me. Thank you, Peru. Um, so just to set the stage, um, I think um, as the uh, introduction specified, you know, privileged access management, identity and access management itself, the whole profession and the, and the cybersecurity domain is undergoing digital transformation, um, just like every other enterprise is struggling to, to move to the cloud, exist in hybrid situations. I think our profession and I am is evolving as well. Um, and of course, uh, the last 2.5 years have been specifically uh, challenging, has accelerated those initiatives, um, has introduced new threat actors, new attack vectors, um, uh, new use cases that we need to deal with. So I think the first question that I'd like to pose to the panel is, what have been the identity security challenges your enterprises have faced on your cloud, forced cloud journeys over the last 2.5 years in terms of hybrid infra, remote workforce, BYOD? So I'd like to first get the endpoint story from, from Diane, if possible. Like how, how has uh, the pandemic treated you from an identity security challenges perspective? Um, so one is the removal of local admin access and how to enforce the concept of, you know, these privilege to the organization has been challenging. Um, you know, those that have privileged access, we have to ensure that um, we have monitoring in place for audibility and accountability and to further, you know, quantify why this level of access is required to users. Um, another point is like the scanning and the patch management process um, to address vulnerabilities like zero day, ensuring the endpoints are up to date and protected with the latest security patches have taken a longer period of time uh, to get down to these endpoints um, from start to finish uh, where endpoints were starting to crash and was causing the disruption, you know, to the end users and to the business. So, and as part of that, it was because, you know, users who didn't live or who lived in, you know, smaller, you know, areas outside of the city didn't have a good Wi-Fi connection. It was really difficult for them to get these patches to the endpoints. So they had to go into the local branches to be able to connect to their network, which was a bit of a convenience inconvenience for these employees and it really wasn't an overall uh, good experience for them. Yeah, so I, I think I'd like to just uh, echo that in the sense that we, what we've observed over the last five, 10 years is the primary source of the attack vectors for 80% of the breaches are originating at the endpoint. And so <clears throat> removing local admin privileges is one of the great uh, sort of holy grails of, of uh, privileged access management programs. And I think what Diane was pointing to were the challenges when you've pushed 90% of your workforce um, remote, they've got all these endpoints out there that intermittently connect to the corporate network, et cetera, and policy enforcement from a privileged access management perspective is challenging. So we've got technologies now, Thankfully, um, the vendors have responded with, uh, with technologies that now take care of this use case and we're starting to address it. So I think I'd like to get the point of view uh, from participants here who lead um, major financial institutions in this country. What, what have you seen over the last 2.5 years, Peru? Yeah. 
Um, I think I would like to echo Deanne's point over there, like in terms of the challenges encountered, continuous verification is one of the things, especially because majority of population, like almost I believe like more than 90% of the workforce has been working from home, and then they have access to this plethora of devices, be it their smartphones, iPads, you know, um, getting access to from their personal laptops or work laptops. So I think in terms of the continuous verification, like what all do they have access to, that has something uh, definitely uh, been a bit challenging. And one of the solutions to that would be like monitor the risk levels, like in terms of if there's anomalies in terms of the risk, yes, we definitely know that something is wrong there. And then, it, then it's the, that point where we essentially go back to our logs and monitoring. The second thing is that now since access is needed for users to do their work and definitely there, there's no, um, because, because it's just the vast majority of users and the vast amount of access, there are no frequent access reviews in place. So it's definitely a challenging situation to actually um, limit the blast radius, which in the sense is like if an attack happens, and especially with the use of a privileged access, how do we exactly mitigate that, okay, like this is what um, the attack is confined to? How do we actually limit the damage to? So I think that's one of the important questions to ask. And in terms of the third, I think it's the, uh, because it's, it's a variety of devices again, it's the dispersing, logging, and monitoring, which is getting your uh, logs from a variety of resources, which includes your endpoints, your smart devices, That's your right. applications, your uh, you know, work laptops, your uh, transactions, getting all those, di all those lo logs as correlated and then making something you know, meaningful out of that, analyzing them on a regular basis, monitoring them. So I think that has become more challenging as well as we have this uh, diverse set of users with everyone working from home, with uh, everyone having access to a majority of devices. So I think that those three are the major challenges I would like right. to see. I'd like to pick up on one point that you raised, privileged threat analytics. In other words, identifying anomalous behavior in real time and being able to inline mitigate that and stop that risk. Now that is extremely challenging at high velocity and uh, the number of transactions per second that need to be analyzed. But I think the, again, once again, the PAM vendors have, have attempted to provide that threat analytics feed that can go into your SIEM platform and raise alerts at the SOC level to, to mitigate risk. So I think that's a really important point. In the, in, you know, in the privilege creep that you talked about with devices and end users, it's impossible to do this without real-time monitoring. So I think that's a great point. Over to you, um, last 2.5 years, how, how's, how have they treated you, Rizek? Um, so I want to take it a, a slightly different track. Uh, past two and a half years with the pandemic and uh, remote work has accelerated, as you all know, uh, the, the cloud-first strategies or cloud-only strategies. And that has amplified a problem that existed even before that, and the fact that not all cloud is the same uh, when it comes to privileged access and access management in general. What I mean by that is, uh, you know, your, your favorite public cloud provider, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, um, they all treat uh, privileged access in particular, but also access management in general uh, in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, concepts are the same. Uh, when rubber meets the road, uh, uh, there are uh, variations and differences. And uh, for organizations that are operating in a complex environment, multi-cloud provide multiple cloud providers, um, it highlights the need that the technical expertise need to be there, specific for each of the vendors. And sometimes with, even within a vendor across AWS, for example, there are multiple ways of tackling the issue. Um, so not having that single pane of glass when it comes to uh, privileged access management, um, uh, identifying what's privileged, uh, and applying um, identity access management controls or privileged access controls uh, uniformly and consistently across the board has been amplified because of that. Right. So I think, you know, Ruzbe, you coming from a highly regulated industry and sector, um, which, you know, kind of mandates security controls on identity controls and privileged access controls through various uh, standards and policies, um, I think this journey where the customers have taken where they're either starting their cloud transformation and journey to the cloud they've got a on-premise and cloud hybrid footprint yeah. multi-cloud footprint this challenge of 
getting a unified governance and risk compliance across all cloud entitlements is now you know, rising up to the C-suite level because <clears throat> the risks attendant are, are very high. And if you are using the public cloud, then the risks are, you know, uh, you know in, in, in terms of psychologically, uh, are also higher. So I think that's a very, very uh, valid point. One thing I want to add is, uh, um, so I'm here in, in, in my capacity as a, in this panel, I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer, uh, on behalf of the fund, or what I'm talking about is not about the issues uh, at the fund specifically. This is, I think, a broader issue that uh, we all uh, live and see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and to your point, uh, from an executive level perspective, cloud is cloud. Uh, at, at a leadership level, I mean, they care, but they don't care. It's, it's cloud. It's incumbent on us identity access management professionals to be able to uh, identify the differences and apply yeah. the uh, controls and uh, uh, control mechanisms uniformly and universally. Right. So I think, I think I'd like to switch a little bit um, to the topic of Gartner's favorite topic on our little niche uh, standing, high standing privilege. Thou shalt not have high standing privileges in your environment. This is uh, one of the guiding principles of zero trust. Um, and so I just wanted to ask, what are the key pain points faced by your organization when you try to address the security risks of standing high privilege in your environment? So uh, for example, from the endpoint perspective, Diane, um, we've all had the situations of user groups who require local admin rights. Um, yep. What are some of the challenges of, um, of sort of addressing those security risks? So it's a mentality shift to enforce, right, the concept of lease privilege, and especially to the developers um, who want basically the keys to the kingdom, right? Um, they think that if they have administrator access that, that they're able to do their job, which isn't the case, right? Um, you also have to know your business, your, um, who you're dealing with, uh, what their roles are, what you know, they need uh, to be able to do their job. And, and as part of that, you need to have like endpoint privilege management tools in place you know, that provides you know, privilege management and application control like IM and PAM that eliminates the admin rights from users and systems to be able to do their jobs. And as you know, the vast uh, majority of security breaches is a result of users and systems that have privileged credentials. That's right. So I think, I think that's an interesting point and I think it echoes my sort of 10 years in the field and the trenches uh, working on this issue is the, essentially the disconnect between the security organization and their objectives and balancing that with end user usability of the platforms, um, uh, friction in end user experience, et cetera. And so I think that was a very valid point about the culture change and um, having some direction in, from a policy standards perspective. Th thank you for that. Um, so uh, Parul, how would you say, um, what would you say standing high privilege means to you in your context and in, in the role that you're in? Yes, um, the, the context of high privilege essentially, um, to me it means that yes, uh, users, uh, they have access, they have admin rights, they have the authority to change, make changes to the system or grant other users the access which are equivalent to admin rights. They have the ability to delete the information from the system as well, install the software, what they want to do. So that's what essentially contributes to high privilege in my understanding. Now, how exactly are the pain, what exactly are the pain points that my organization has uh, faced, or like let's just say in the last uh, two and a half years since pandemic, I would like to say um, a lot of third party or let's just say contractors, they usually are, uh, th they usually have access to all this PII information because they are the ones who are uh, developing the, the, the source code and so they, they, have, they have access to, uh, to that information. Now, uh, what exactly is preventing those contractors from not sending that particular information by mistake to let's just say their personal Gmail knowing the fact that they have uh, 
um, personal laptops or that their the controls have not been vetted thoroughly. So I think that's one of the pain points. And essentially, one can argue that if you're using to third party, then there ha essentially has to be a vendor risk assessment conducted on that grounds. But then how often do those controls get vetted as another pain point and is another story to it. So <laughs> I would like to yeah, um, reiterate what Deanne said. Yep, the concept of privileged access management, like knowing who has access to and what has access to, and then uh, essentially monitoring it, and then regularly, frequently reviewing those access rights is an essential must. So I think, yeah, it's uh, when it comes to that pain point, I would say the access to confidential or sensitive information by the third parties, that's, that's one of the things. I, th I think that's, that's really, really interesting because um, as enterprises move towards business models that um, sort of consume more and more managed services by third parties, this, this third party supply chain risk now is, is becoming a very, very um, high risk that needs to be mitigated because obviously you can have all the attestations you want from your third party suppliers, but it's not just the technology and the security controls, it's people and processes. I've seen many, many third party supplier risks um, slip through the cracks because of broken processes of onboarding and offboarding. So again, um, you know, I just wanted to stress that we're not all about PAM solutions and implementing technology. It's a question of closing that loop with people in process. So I think, um, you know, Ruzbe, do you want to just uh, add anything there? Absolutely. I want to build on what uh, Parul just mentioned. So um, a lot of times, us identity professionals, when we're talking about privileged access, we're talking about you know, the usual suspects, your, your admin uh, credentials and your infrastructure, your domain admins, pseudo accounts, root access, etc. cetera. Um, one area where I think uh, standing privileges are not being addressed as rigorously is inside the business application. I'm gonna use an example, your favorite HRIS tool or ITSM, they carry a lot of uh, sensitive information, not necessarily admin type access either, you know, Within your HRIS, you know, we business all... Business user, right? Business, a business user, an High privileged HR... business user, yeah. What do you mean? High privileged business users. High privileged, well, let's say your HRIS application, right? Yeah. Um, you have your HR personnel who have access to our sensitive personal information, our social security numbers, social insurance numbers. I would consider that privileged. That's correct. And the question is, does an HR person mm -hmm. uh, need access to see every employee's social insurance number at all times? I would argue that the answer is no. That's correct. And I think that type of privileged access is going unaddressed in a lot of cases. That's right. And uh, part of it is because us as customers or consumers are not putting the onus on business application providers to give us those mechanisms. So I think it's incumbent on organizations and us as consumers to put that pressure on to Absolutely. say we, we, we need that type of access to be considered privileged and taken away on an ongoing permanent basis. Right. I, I think that's, that's crucial because so many of our data, so much of our personal information has moved to the cloud and, and is, is, is there. What I really liked about your remark was specifically around you know, who needs to see when what. So for example, we could have a use case where a HR administrator may be prompted just in time for another multi-factor authentication to perform a specific transaction. Absolutely. Right, with their existing user identity. Right, it, could, it doesn't necessarily have to be high-privileged identity. Or, or ask we, for permission. We provision that access to perform their job function in a just-in-time multi-factored if it's really critical, so that we get that added assurance and risk assurance Absolutely. that we're you know, authorizing the right transaction and the right action at the right time. So that's a great point. I think I'm gonna move on to our next question, which is again, um, sort of um, harkens back to the biggest cliche over the 2.5 years about zero trust and, and its um, applicability. Is it a concept? Is it a technology? Is it a framework? Is it a recommendation? <laughs> so um, regardless of what that is, I'd just like to understand how critical a comprehensive analysis of privileged access. So I'll start with 
Diane, um, you know, what are the challenges of identifying all that local admin access on the endpoints that you manage? Um, it's, it's very challenging and it's important for um, any organization, small or big, you know, to perform uh, an assessment of who has, you know, privileged access on the endpoints. Um, and once you identify, you, you have to work with, you know, your line of business to determine how are you going to remove this? Um, what is the best approach? Because you can't just take it overnight from them, right? They still need to be able to do their job. And especially in a financial institution where you have investors who are, you know, they need, they supposedly need this capability, you know, to be able to do stuff. But in the end, they, re they really don't. So... And I think it's also working with like third party risk assessment as well um, with the vendors um, who we have um, support from to review their capabilities and see, you know, how they can improve their capabilities within their application to be able to, you know, remediate and identify any, you know, potential cybersecurity threats in advance. Yeah, perfect. And I think having also an advanced and robust, you know, endpoint security stack that provides, you know, EDM and EDR and many other security tools will help to, you know, have a strong and effective cybersecurity posture to detect malicious attacks as well. Yeah, I think that's a great so, point. I mean, yeah, because I think because of the nature of those endpoints, they don't necessarily connect to the mothership all the time in this day and age. So we need some offline methods to enforce policies. So I think the only way that we found that's possible is either the endpoints connect to some cloud service, which um, you know, pushes those policies to the endpoint, or we have an agent. Those are the two basic use cases that we can uh, address the risk. So Parul, um, over to you. Um, how important is this? Or how difficult is it to convince leaders to, per to perform a comprehensive um, risk analysis on privileged access. Right. I think uh, this is where we actually think about, hey, uh, what's the balance between doing the business and then not acting a hindrance to the business which comes into picture. So at this point, the challenges which I feel that have arisen in the last 2.5 years is definitely there has been increasing uh, Com increasing complexity with decreasing visibility. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is being um, compliant with, let's just say, our regulations and our laws and our company policies, like amidst all the work from home arrangement and the plethora of devices that the users have access to. The third part of it is definitely having enough sufficient logging and monitoring in place and making sure that we are capturing enough data elements so that uh, we can track back, track it down to like what, what went wrong, who did wrong, and then we do have a strong incident response, mid incident response plan to actually mitigate that damage and confine that damage and remediate it. Um, I think one of the challenges as well faced in this is configuring the DLP policies as well as the rule set. So when it comes to, um, let's just say I worked in the DLP, and when it comes to configuring of those policies, fine tuning the rule sets, Definitely, we have had a challenge to say that, okay, like these are all the false positives and these are all the blocked and quarantined ones, but they are all false positives and then this is acting as a hindrance to the business. So now what do we do here? We decrease the threshold, but hey, if we decrease the threshold, there is a possibility that someone might just think that, oh yeah, they have decreased it and let's just, you know, skip under the radar. Like that's, that's what happens. So I think it's definitely, um, uh, I think it's definitely a matter of time where, we, there where the business and including the people, employees, everyone thinks about like what is the balance that has to be maintained between um, not acting as a hindrance as well, but also making sure that we are catching the right people. Parul, you're a loss to the diplomatic service because that was put very <laughs> diplomatically <laughs> and in, in a very uh, professional manner. I think we deal with those situations every day, Ruse Bay. Uh, where we've got, you know, 15,000 lines CSV and inventory of privileged accounts, but unfortunately the taxonomy and the definitions we've developed for those accounts um, traditionally are not meeting our needs today. So you, you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So one of the areas that I think 
uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's, it requires uh, development and maturity across the board, is, uh, is the fact that, as you said, for, for privileged credentials, we have the taxonomies. We know, you know within our AD infrastructure, within our databases, Linux forums, et cetera, what's considered privileged. Uh, what's missing is when it comes to our data, our functionalities. Uh, I'm going to use SharePoint as an example. An organization may have very sensitive critical information on the SharePoint, uh, SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, et cetera, uh, that don't necessarily require any admin type access to see. You don't even necessarily need to have any right access to it. Even seeing the data and being able to take a dump of it is, is going to cause damage or put the organization at risk. And that area, I think, is, is, is something that is universally a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what is, is one of the challenges for all identity professionals. Uh, we depend quite a bit on data governance, specifically classification, mm -hmm. labeling, and tagging. Yeah. And uh, as long as that element is not uh, mature and it doesn't paint the picture of where the risk lies and where sensitive data is, the identity in, uh, controls and PAM controls specifically are going to fall short. And I always use the analogy, you know, if, if you have sensitive things in, in a chest, if you don't know what's in it, I don't know what size of padlock I have to put on it. Absolutely. So I think that's one of the challenges. I, I think, I think that's, that's critical because we need to close that gap between mm -hmm. data classification, asset prioritization, Absolutely. risk prioritization, and connect that with our identity uh, repositories and properly understand the risk. Because that's the only way that we're going to get a proper risk picture. Because it's not just to say that you are root on a Unix machine. Uh, you may be root on a dev Unix machine which may not have live production data, Absolutely. which may require lesser controls than on a prod Unix machine where Absolutely. you are root and you have access to That's sensitive data. So <clears throat> I think this little nuance is what we really are challenged with from our customer perspective when we're delivering large-scale PAM programs, is if you don't have that starting base of asset and risk prioritization, and then data classification tied into your identity repository, it makes it very difficult to go back and you know, put that genie Absolutely. back in the bottle, right, so, so to speak. So I think, uh, again, pardon me, am I laptop's going to sleep? But <laughs> <laughs> so next question. Um, if you basically, um, I think I'm just going to switch it around and be a little bit lighthearted. If you were to take your 20-something self by the neck, right? <laughs> and what advice, I think it's apropos here, since we have many young people and many people who are interested in newcomers to cyber, I think it'd be interesting to hear from some veterans. I'll start with you, Diane. Uh, what, would, what would be the advice to that 20-year-old Dan Jake <laughs> to successfully Actually, navigate a cybersecurity career, specifically? Actually actually read something uh, a few days ago. It's called ABC. Um, always be curious, keep learning. So basically this means um, doing your homework, you know, continuous reading, practicing um, any chance you get. Reach out to others that are in the cybersecurity field um, and inquire, ask questions, get help. You know, is this what, you know, you want to do? There's no right or wrong answer here, right? The key is to take the first step and to move forward. The success is really, you know, up to you, us, as people, right? Great advice, Diane. I, I wish I'd listened. I, I wish we'd, <laughs> we'd met 20 years ago. Um, so, uh, Parul, how, how about yourself? Um, yeah, so uh, I would like to say at the age of 20, I mean, yes, be curious and be willing to learn. Don't be afraid to ask. I mean, I, I strongly go by the philosophy and the saying that the answer is always going to be no if you don't ask. So yeah, don't be afraid to ask and then be curious and be, uh, you know, just, just explore. And I would like to share uh, a bit of example from my personal life for the audience here. Like initially I was working as a software developer for two years. And then pretty much during those two years, sitting in front of the computer screen, I realized, okay, this is not my cup of tea, which is going to work for the rest of my life. So what's next? I transitioned, uh, I moved into a, well, not directly into a cybersecurity role, but I took a course to actually learn the skills needed for to get into a cybersecurity role. 
And that was interesting. Uh, and at that point, I did have a bit of struggles to actually end up getting into a cybersecurity role, so I did manage to hop into a help desk role, which was, again, interestingly, um, taught me different angles about the IT system, network aspect of it, system, server, like those configurations, which is actually essential and is contributing a lot to my present to present, present day work experience. I mean, so I think it's important to remember at the end of the day is, like, it's not the end that, ma uh, that matters. It's actually your destination that counts. So yeah, be willing to explore as much as you can. As can. I mean, age is just a number, like especially in your 20s and 30s, yes, just go out and explore. Remember that cybersecurity has a lot of dimensions and fields to it, and so yeah, like engage in as, much, as many projects as you can, and be a little more of like risk averseing. I wish I was more of like a risk taker back in my 20s, but at that point, uh, career and getting a good job was a priority, so yeah, it was like that. So now I'm into a risk management, uh, risk consultant role, so it's yeah, pretty much I see myself evolving and learning every day in terms of like inter either it's interaction with the clients or either in terms of my technical knowledge or either in terms of like the personal growth. So I would say, yeah, at, at, at the age of, I mean, when, when, you're, when you're beginning your career, there would be setbacks, there would be failures, but remember, like, all those have been uh, embedded into your life or into that particular phase to actually teach you something out of it and make you a stronger person. So yeah, just be curious and be willing to learn more. That would be my two cents. Thank you, Parul. I think uh, if I turn the question to you, Ruzbe, it would be pretty, pretty similar to my experiences. Le why did we have that last tequila in 1995 or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I think you, maybe you can give a more politically correct uh, regret in your cyber career. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit and say in my, when I was 20, there was no cryptocurrency. Otherwise, I would have said, go buy Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My, uh, my advice to my 20-year-old self would have been to be, like uh, Perul and Dan mentioned, to be more curious, but uh, specifically uh, be more technical. Uh, not that I wasn't, but you know, be more technical in a, in a broader range of subjects and items. Um, cryptography, for example, I think that's, that's an area that's being neglected and there's a lot of need for it. Um, and it's being, from a cybersecurity perspective, it's not being, uh, um, engaged by enough people. So that's, that's one area that I think would have been key for me to go back and say, be, be more technical, roll up your sleeve, do, do more things in your own time. Perfect. And coming back to your oh, question. Gosh. We <laughs> discussed <laughs> this, you weren't gonna do this. Okay. Um, no, no, I would say <clears throat> over a 20 year, like, like you, Parul, I went through network operations, security operations, on call 24 seven, 365, all of that, to my current role. And I think um, the key takeaway was um, do not be the loudest person in the room, right? Um, I, think, I think if I was to take my 20-year-old self and you know, give some advice, I would say you are not necessarily the smartest person in the room at any given point in time. You need to listen, understand, and I think what we've done at Ipsidey is try to live that philosophy where we, you know, half our engineers are, are, are women. Um, we've got uh, four nationalities. The entire Indian subcontinent is represented. So we've got a diversity of thought, a healthy tension. Um, I, I think uh, those lessons learned over 20 years of, uh, of taking a back seat, um, giving a more inclusive and, um, and helpful and collaborative environment. That's what I would say to my 20-year-old self. Just be quiet once in a while and <laughs> let, uh, let others <laughs> Um, teach you and learn from others. I, I can relate to that. <laughs> that's, that's my uh, little confession. I think uh, closing remarks, um, I wanted to mention uh, Beyond Trust, our sponsor, thanking them for, for the opportunity for uh, having us at, at Canadian Women in Cybersecurity. Uh, a big shout out to the CyberX crew who've worked tirelessly to put this event together. Um, and I think one of the conference highlights was the opening remarks by Dr. Gina Cody um, I found them hugely inspirational. Um, I found them, <clears throat> you know, truly a call to action for us to, as business leaders, as leaders of security companies, to properly understand, be quiet, listen, um, understand different points of view, um, have that healthy tension that ultimately delivers better outcomes for our society 
and better outcomes for our valued customers, which is, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're commercial enterprises and the bottom line drives us a lot of the times, but I think it's an important point to make. Yeah. So uh, thank you everyone for your participation here. I hope you have a great conference um, and um, see you at the booths. Thank you.